That then a look at Eddie Frierson playing the role of Christy Mathewson. And Christy, without a doubt, had one fascinating career, if you consider all the people he met and the era that he was play playing in. Hi, Christy. Hi. How are you? Good. How are nice you? Nice to meet you. I, uh, I've never been a part of this, what do you call it, television? To yeah, think, television. But, but I always made it a habit whenever I met a new sports writer for the first time. I think it's good to befriend them and like to give you this as my gift. It's a New York Giants warm-up sweater. Oh, thank you. I guess I should put it on in keeping <coughs> with the spirit of interviewing Christy Mathewson. <coughs> um, so, uh, all those years with the New York Giants, you must know New York City very well, huh? I do. Uh, it's, in fact, I, I can't imagine a better place uh, to play ball, except maybe Factoryville or Honesdale. Or How were the fans Hillsmore. back then? Were they wild they got, and rowdy? Or? Wonderful fans. I mean, we always, you know, what was fun was that uh, the women started coming out to the ballpark, and uh, once George Cohan and Flo Ziegfeld and the fellows uh, from Broadway started coming out, and then all the women found out that they could see some of the stars at the, at the ballpark, and uh, the newspapers took great delight in then giving reports on the women's wardrobe and who wore the biggest hat every day out at the ballpark. But it was rowdy. It was a good, fun crowd, and everyone so had a really like good time. Gossip columns then. Well, sure, in the box seats anyway. But uh, you know, in your cheap seats, you're going to get uh, all the all the real good fans. And the thing about uh, New York fans always, uh, when I was playing, is they knew the game. Uh, so if uh, something went against the home team, but it deserved to, they would applaud, and if it didn't, uh, then they would, they would boo. Now, Chris, yeah, you know, I, I know about all your lifetime victories and your glorious career in New York with the Giants, but a lot of people from when I come from, when they think of the greatest, like Babe Ruth comes to mind, or Ty Cobb, does that make you feel bad? No, not at all. I mean, uh, Ruth was a terrific player. I didn't really care much for him as a man. Uh, and Cobb, of course, uh, his only equal was uh, Hannes Wagner when I played. Uh, I have no problem being mentioned in the same uh, sentence with either of those two fellows. Ty Cobb, was he really as bad a guy as we were told and, and, and was written about him? Well, it's, it's really, it's tough because Cobb was just a hard-nosed fella. I mean, he was a mean cuss, but he, I never had any problem with him. As a matter of fact, uh, he considered me and Mickey Cochran his only two friends in baseball, and I don't quite understand that, although to a point I do. Uh, there was a, an incident in 1910 where Cobb went into the stands and bloodied a uh, crippled fellow who had been riding the whole game, and after about the fourth glass beer mug that got thrown at him by this fellow, and he had to dodge it, and then he was called something that no man should be called, and he rushed into the crowd and, and beat this fellow pretty senseless. And uh, Van Johnson, who was president of the American League, suspended him, and find him and all of us who heard the story it, it, to a man throughout the the national and american league felt that cobb was justified in beating this fellow uh, because we, we you know we played in these ballparks where you have things flying at you out of the park and really people, they threw things then well sure i mean you're serving gl beer in glass mugs so i don't know why anyone would want to umpire uh, this fellow Rutterham just had a terrible time. You know they'll time. fix that. Years later, they're they serve beer in paper cups. I don't think they cups. should ser serve beer at all at a bar ballpark. It makes people too rowdy. Yeah. But uh, uh, although I enjoy glass myself on occasion, mm. uh, the, but the, not very often. I mean, you are, you as I'm. No, as but I know I'm the told. difference between beer and wine. So mm. uh, the thing uh, thing was was then Cobb found out that I was on his side about that, and then years later when I was managing the Cincinnati Reds, he had an incident. Uh, during spring training where he felt he couldn't stay with his ball club for the last two weeks of spring training and he wired me. Uh, I was in Nashville at the time managing the Cincinnati Reds and asked if he could finish spring training the last two weeks with my ball club and I said sure if you want to be a co-manager and work with my younger players that'd be great and uh, so he came over and for the last two weeks um, he worked with uh, Eddie Roush and, and my younger players and helped them out a, a great deal but we probably only talked 20 minutes that whole two weeks but he still considered me his friend. Now as a lover of Broadway plays. You actually wrote a play, right, once? <laughs> well, yeah, if you, if you can call it uh, well, a, a you real wrote it. So you Yeah, it. and it actually was at the Lyric uh, on 42nd Street in, 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 on Broadway, yeah. And, and you were around these parts when uh, the owner of Boston wanted to make no-no Nanette, so he sold Babe Ruth to the New York Yankees. Where were you the day that Babe Ruth went to the New York Yankees? I was, uh, I was uh, with the Cincinnati Reds uh, when that happened, uh, and we all knew that Ruth was a, uh, was a tremendous pitcher. He's the best left-handed pitcher that I ever saw throw. He threw, he's the only person who, who I ever saw who threw as hard as Jack Cheesebro and Walter Johnson. I mean, he was by far the best left-handed pitcher I ever saw, but he could also hit the ball. Hey, you won 37 <coughs> games one year? How did you do that? It was actually 38 that year, and they Sorry. took, they, Sorry. it's all right. You, they, you they took, took away, by well, they took, they took the one away. That was the Merkel game, uh, when Fred Merkel didn't go to second base, and uh, they decided to take that victory that we 
legitimately won away from us uh, by enforcing a rule that had never been enforced before that day, whereby in, at the end of, if, if the third out of an inning is a force out, no runs can score on that play, but it had never been enforced ever in the history of baseball in the bottom half of the ninth inning when two men were out, out after a clean base hit that would obviously win the game. We uh, had a guest in the studio oh, a little the letter. while ago who, who showed us the, the letter, and, and a fan just put the big six on I know you may not have loved the nickname, but it certainly got the letter delivered to you. That, no address, no city, no nothing, just the big six, and, and it winds up on your doorstep. Well, the press has power. <laughs> but, I mean, your yeah. popularity, it must have been almost impossible, impossible well, to measure. And it was all very flattering, but uh, very early in my lifetime, I decided never to put too much stock in what others said about me, good or bad, because others can't really see what's on the inside. And I tried to advise... Uh, younger players like Fred Merkel and Jim Thorpe uh, to do the same and I think that's really a healthy way to look at it because um, people's opinions are all subjective and it doesn't matter how good of a ball player you are or how good of a person you are the people who are writing or talking about you don't necessarily know you so you really have to give away uh, any feelings that you might feel for some of that criticism if you honestly feel that it's not realistic. Now, Christy, uh